He held a meeting with the congressional leadership on the night of the Pearl Harbor attack. And it was members of Congress. They asked him, Mr. President, are you going to ask for a declaration of war? And he said he hadn't decided yet. Now that was simply a ruse. He knew perfectly well he's going to ask for a declaration of war. But when he said, I haven't decided yet, the leaders of Congress said, well, damn it, Mr. President, we're going to declare war whether you ask for a declaration or not. This was exactly what he wanted to hear. Because this war had become a war declared by Congress on the initiative of Congress on behalf of the American people. And even though World War II in the next three and a half years was by far the most costly foreign war the United States ever fought, three times the casualties of World War I, American support for the war never flagged. In fact, American support for the war simply grew as the war became more costly. And more to the permanent point, Americans became convinced that Woodrow Wilson had been right, that Franklin Roosevelt was right, that the United States needed to take responsibility for world peace and world order. And Roosevelt got the bigger thing that he wanted, not simply American support for the war, but a change of the American mind. And in fact, this change of American mind was so profound that once changed, it has never changed back. Not since, the, not since Franklin Roosevelt died in April 1945, so that's 63 years ago. At the time of Roosevelt's death, the United States had taken a leadership position in creating the United Nations. This was an update of the League of Nations that Woodrow Wilson had proposed and the Americans had rejected in 1919. But now Americans signed on to the United Nations and signed on to the idea that the United States needed to keep order around the world. And it was under this new mindset that the United States sent troops to Korea in 1950, that the United States sent troops to Vietnam in the 1960s, that the United States sent troops to the Persian Gulf once in 1990 for the 1991 war, and that the United States sent troops to Iraq in 2003. Well, I've used up more than my time, so I'm not going to get to the fourth president of the fourth war, but you might guess who that president would be, George W. Bush. And the fourth war would be the war in Iraq. And I could ask, well, I'll just ask you to think about the extent to which the lessons of Theodore Roosevelt and the war against Spain of Woodrow Wilson and the First World War, and Franklin Roosevelt in World War II, apply to the current situation in Iraq. I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. Questions? Questions? Oh, yes. Here. Who blew up the Maine? Who blew up the Maine? It's a question that historians still debate. It was a mysterious explosion at the time. The war hawks, including Theodore Roosevelt, immediately pointed the finger at Spanish agents. They must have done the dastardly deed. There was no evidence in favor of that. A Navy board was immediately gathered, and the Navy board said that it was probably an external explosion, which, from which the conclusion was drawn that somebody had planted a bomb next to the ship. Subsequent investigation suggested that that initial conclusion was wrong. In fact, that it was an internal explosion. And the best historical evidence is that the ship blew up more or less spontaneously. The main was a ship that was fueled by coal. Coal is kept in basically big fuel tanks, they're called bunkers, in the belly of the ship. And when the bunker is full of coal, it's fairly safe. But when the bunker gets nearly empty, there's all this coal dust in the air. And the least spark can set off the coal dust, can ignite that, which then will ignite the ammunition that's kept nearby. And so the ship blew up. But the reaction to the main sinking and the, the fact that Roosevelt and the War Hawks pointed to this as an example of what Spain would do caused some people a century later to liken that to an early version of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. So if Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, the United States needs to take action to get them out of his hands to overthrow him. It turned out that there were no weapons of mass destruction. It turned out that the Spanish didn't blow up the main. But in each case, that provided a pretext 
for the war. And once the troops are on the ground, then the war has a life of its own. Other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, the first part of it was if the United States had not been in the Philippines? Yes. Okay, yes. The reason the Japanese had to attack the United States at Pearl Harbor was that they knew the United States held this position in the Philippines, which was right next to the route from Indochina down to the Dutch East Indies. Roosevelt had already given the Japanese an ultimatum, don't go any farther than Indochina. The Japanese decided they had to go farther to get the oil from the Dutch East Indies. They knew that Roosevelt would oppose that and that the Americans were located right along the route. So as long as the United States held that position, the Japanese could not make a run down to the Indies, the East Indies which is now Indonesia. If the United States had not been in the Philippines, take that out of the picture. Then the Japanese knew, that would have known, that they could have captured the Dutch East Indies, and the United States would have been in no position to oppose that. The closest American ships would have been in Hawaii, which was a long way away. And the American people quite possibly, quite likely, would have said, what's the Dutch East Indies to us? But the Japanese believed that the United States was in a position to thwart this expansion. And that's why the Japanese had to hit the American fleet. And by the way, it was on the same day that the Japanese attacked the American position in the Philippines. So without the United States in the Philippines, Japanese thinking would have been quite different. And I just would add one thing. For the 40 years before the outbreak of World War II, for the 40 years from American annexation to the Philippines, of the Philippines to Pearl Harbor, the Japanese always had to factor this American position and the powerful American naval base at Subic Bay in the Philippines into their thinking. And it galled them that the U.S. held this position in such a strategically sensitive spot to the Japanese. Because the Japanese, now this is something that you all ought to bear in mind. The Japanese thought they were perfectly justified in doing what they did. And I would argue that as horrible a monster as Hitler was, Hitler and most of the Germans thought they were justified in doing what they did. Now this doesn't mean they were justified, but it's important to remember that everybody thinks they're justified in doing what they were doing. The Japanese explained their expansion to themselves and to the world in terms of, look at the United States. The United States has its empire, including the Philippines, but mostly including all the Western Hemisphere. Heck. The United States has half the globe to itself. All we're looking for is a slice of East Asia. Fair's fair, isn't it? And they thought that the United States ought to accept that. I'm sure they were sincerely convinced that they had a right to dominate the Philippines and the East Indies the way the United States dominated the Cuba and Puerto Rico and Mexico and most of South America. And so they felt that they had every right to do it in the United States was simply being difficult and was being overly aggressive in preventing it.